Welcome to the next episode of Biblical Worldview in the Marketplace webinars, everyone. This is presented by Houston Baptist University's Center for Christianity and Business. You can get more information about HVU's Center for Christianity and Business. And be sure to subscribe to our podcast and also sign up to receive free access to all issues of the Christian Business Review Journal by visiting our website at christianityandbusiness.com. And before I introduce our guests, we just want to let um, everyone know you can feel, well, actually, we're not going to be having some PowerPoint, so you're not going to need to worry about switching between video frames. It's going to be pretty straightforward here today. Um, we're going to get to hear from uh, a, a highly reputable speaker here today, an academic practitioner, a lot of experience in the business world, Dr. Michael Kafferke. He's going to talk to us about biblical themes that can transform how you do business. And I know many of you uh, seeing that you're in the academic world in the Christian Business Faculty Association. I'm sure you're already, uh, you know, Michael and his work. Uh, he has earned advanced degrees in religion, public health, and business administration. He was professor of management and the Ruth McKee Chair for Entrepreneurship and Business Ethics at Southern Adventist University until his retirement in 2017. Prior to his work in higher ed, Michael served as a pastor and then worked for 20 years in the healthcare industry at various levels of leadership, including frontline supervisor, department manager, director of business development, CFO, COO, and CEO. So there's not too many roles he hasn't held in the private, public, social sectors. Um, well, not the public sector, not yet. I guess you, you're going to have to run for office here so we can uh, complete the circle, Michael. He's the author of many articles, conference presentations, and books, including two peer-reviewed books designed for Christian colleges and universities, Management of Faith-Based Perspective, and Business Ethics and Biblical Perspective, a Comprehensive Introduction. And he served as editor of the Journal of Biblical Integration and Business. Also has been uh, a longtime contributor to the Christian Business Review Journal produced by the Center for Christianity and Business at HBU. And in 2013, he received the Sharon G. Johnson Award from the Christian Business Faculty Association and national recognition of his efforts toward integrating faith and business and his scholarship. Michael, thanks for coming in to help us grow today. I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Darren, and uh, welcome, everybody. And yeah, I've been monitoring the chat comments there, where you're all from. So welcome from all over the country and also internationally. Uh, quick shout out to Carlos from Beirut, Lebanon. Good to have you here, my friend, and uh, Stephanie Sheehan, with whom I worked at Southern Adventist University. Hello to you as well. Welcome. So we've got a lot of material to cover. I'm really excited to get right into this biblical themes. It's, it's the topic that I've spent most of my time, the last 12 to 15 years, considering uh, in my own scholarship and so forth. So thank you so much for the invitation to participate and lead in this. It's an honor to, to share some things that are so important. Today I'm going to be talking about some biblical themes. Uh, you'll hear that word more than once. And uh, if you want more information about this or if there's something that I say that you're kind of confused about, be sure and ask a question. We'll leave time for that at the end here today, but you can also email me at mcafferkey at southern.edu if you would like to offline. Now, I'm going to be talking a lot about imitation today, imitating Christ. And so I just want to say up front that nothing I say today should be construed to mean that my invitation, imitation of Christ, your imitation of Christ, is what opens God, God's gracious love and kindness towards us in his finished work in Christ. It doesn't change God's love for us. It changes our love and enriches our love for him. Just to make sure we, we understand here the, in terms of the theology of salvation. 
The biblical themes are drawn from the entire Bible. This is not just a New Testament Christian perspective. In fact, when I looked at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, uh, back in my research, I said, wow, he's referring to the Old Testament. So I've got to look in the Old Testament. And so we're going to do a little bit of that as well. So the themes are drawn from the entire Bible. They start with the writings of Moses. They go right on through most of the books of the Bible through to Revelation. Examples of these themes that you'll find throughout the Bible are include creation, covenant, uh, the idea of shalom, holiness, which we'll spend some time on today, Sabbath, justice, wisdom, which we'll spend a little bit of time on today, the idea of truth, loving kindness, righteousness, and redemption, which I've reserved some time for that one also. Each theme represents a dimension of the character of God or the identity of Jesus Christ, sometimes both. These themes are, and this is a really important point, these themes are intertwined, interrelated, inseparable, which means that we just can't cherry pick the one we like and uh, kind of gloss over, ignore the others, because they're all interrelated. It's kind of like the, an electric power grid, right? We've got a gen generating station, and you've got transmission lines interconnected uh, as a network. Now, I understand from this last winter that there was a, a network that was kind of separated or partially separated. I don't know. I don't live there. But when there were some very cold temperatures, the power network went down. It's difficult to get power. Uh, they didn't have the network maybe sufficient as, as they would have preferred. But these themes of scripture that talk about Christ, his character, and our imitation of him are interrelated, interconnected like a grid. And so when one power line goes down, you can easily get to the others. In fact, you start with any one of them, and it's not long before you get to the others because they are so closely intertwined. We are called to imitate God in these ways. And by imitating these particular character traits and points of identity, we are keeping our eyes fixed upon him. These are what makes our work Christ-centered, because they truly are centered on him. And we are being transformed into his likeness. Now, in some cases, these themes are radical departures from the uh, common or popular world of business. And this makes it a real challenge for the Christian. If we want to be Christ-centered and yet be successful in the marketplace, what are we going to do about this? Some of these themes are, are so radical, they are hard sayings to some of us. They apply broadly to buyers and sellers, supervisors and subordinates, at all levels of an organization. They apply to organizations within the context of a marketplace or an industry. And they also apply in a much broader sense in terms of industries in an economy and then even national economic competition within the world of business. The more we study the framework that these uh, themes represent and provide, the more we emulate its principles, I believe the more we can grow in the knowledge of Christ, as 2 Peter 3.18 says. These are th the themes we're going to talk about today, wisdom, holiness, redemption, are three ways to be distinctively different in the marketplace. But they're not always easy to imitate, and they're not always simple. Now, I don't know if you've noticed that some Christians in business tend to get a little sensitive when uh, a lot of scripture is quoted for them, shared with them. That's too preachy. Just tell us how to do our work better. Tell us, remind us to love as Jesus loved. If we claim something is too preachy, we marginalize it, we discount it, and we can avoid doing anything about it. 
So if you have this feeling today, that, oh, Kafir key is being too preachy, I mean, encourage you to spend some time in these themes in scripture for yourself. And keep in mind that the biblical themes require community dialogue, not just individual understanding. So let's jump into wisdom, first of all. We're going to talk about wisdom, holiness, and redemption today. I could have picked other three others, but these were ones that I felt God was leading me to share today. Wisdom takes us into the world of leadership and leadership decisions. Now, the wisdom of the world is built primarily on what we would call egoism or relativism. Maximize wealth for yourself and the organization. Exploit your competitors' weaknesses. Treat ethical um, mistakes or lapses as business expenses. Hide your wrongdoing if possible. And if you can't hide it, blame somebody else. Always emphasize the positive. Take care of yourself and let other people take care of themselves. There are other ways we could characterize the popular wisdom of business these days, but those come to mind the most in contrast to what the scripture shares with us. You're familiar with the passage in Proverbs, it's said more than once, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One is, is understanding. And what we're, gonna, what we're considering today is knowledge of the Holy One. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There's a lot of packed into that phrase. Biblical ideas of wisdom is not primarily the time value of money. Primarily, it's the time value of morality. The longer we hold in our hearts and in our actions the principles of flourishing life, the ethical ideas shared in Scripture, the longer we promote these and hold to them, the more valuable we are in the marketplace, according to King Solomon in Proverbs. Moses introduced the idea of wisdom. In his writings, in Deuteronomy 4, 6, he says, keep the commandments and do them for this is your wisdom. And of course, he was referring to the entire community of faith, not just individuals. It's the community's wisdom he has in mind here. Not to completely ignore the importance of individual wisdom, but it's communal in focus. That's the scripture's primary interest is wisdom in the community and the impact on the whole community of wisdom. So biblical wisdom is primarily about moral understanding that leads to ethical actions and that benefit the entire community. In contrast, foolishness is the opposite. The fools in the Bible are the people that lack moral understanding or who discount or ignore as applied to practical life, including the leadership of, of uh, ethics, wisdom in the scripture means masterful understanding and skill, the ability to consider something so diligently that you get insight from it. And I think this is the challenge that many leaders uh, have, and most leaders want wisdom, because most leaders face the kinds of questions that are complicated and difficult. In Proverbs, King Solomon said, we should pursue wisdom. And that word pursue is very interesting. It kind of gives the idea in the original of, of chasing something that is going to get away if we don't really go after it. So apparently wisdom is something that we need to actively pursue. He also said in Proverbs that when you get wisdom, you're doing something really good for yourself. You're loving yourself. Proverbs 9, 19, verse 8. When we get to the New Testament, a striking statement is made by the Apostle Paul. He says that Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Jesus Christ himself is the wisdom of God. So if you ask yourself, what is the wisest thing God ever did? 
well, you might say, well, he created this world, world, and we find creation tied to wisdom in the Proverbs and in Psalms. But the wisest thing God ever did was to send Jesus Christ. It is in Jesus Christ we see God's wisdom. Now, what does this mean for business? Well, business can be a repository for wisdom in the community for all things economic and all relationships economic. The economic dimension, dimension of life, uh, BISM can be the, the place that people can turn to for wisdom, but not just street smarts about how to make money. For the Christian, the Christians in business can be the repository collectively, the Christian community, the repository for, for moral wisdom in the economic dimensions of life. Another implication of this, the scripture idea, is that the more complicated the issues, the more likely we need to include other people in the wider community in the conversation. The core ethical problem that most, in fact, all, I would say, all leaders face, I hate to make it too simplified here and too categorical, but most leaders face the most difficult challenge is the tension between what one person wants and what the community needs. And the leader is at the vortex of that, trying to make decisions on the behalf of the individual and at the community at the same time. We see this in scripture several places. Uh, there's an interesting story, I won't take time to tell it now, but uh, it's in, uh, let's see, I think it's Exodus chapter 32, where Moses, uh, is faced with a very challenging decision. It's this tension between individual needs and wants and the community needs and wants, where the, the practical idea is to include the widen the conversation. If you're a leader, widen the conversation to include people from the community. That might mean on occasion, listen to some people who are not Christians because they're a part of the community and the decision that you're about to make is gonna impact them also. There was a manager once uh, of an organization and on one particular day, two employees came, both employees, they came separately. They each came, uh, one came first and the other one came second, different time of the day. And each complained about the other employee. The manager went home that night and thought about it. What should we do? Two employees complaining about each other, both very important people in the department they worked in, very important, central to the organization. The next day, the manager went to each one individually and said, I need to meet with you at 10 o'clock this morning in the conference room. Went to the other person, I need to meet with you at 10 o'clock in the morning in the conference room. Okay, they agreed. So the manager arrived about two minutes after 10. Fashionably late, intentionally late. And here were the two people who had been complaining about each other sitting in the room. So the manager said, you're each valuable. Together, you're more valuable to the organization. But the, the, thing, the feelings you have right now or like a cancer, eating away and destroying the community in this organization. So I'm not gonna tell you what to do. In fact, I'm gonna leave the room and I'm gonna give you a challenge. In fact, it's an expectation. As your supervisor, I want you to stay in this room and have a conversation and don't come out until you get it resolved. The feelings you have for each other don't come out until they're resolved. Manager left the room, leaving them in shock. Manager, as I'm told, went back to the office and wondered what's gonna happen. <laughs> Is anything gonna come of this? I think the manager did the, the wise thing by including the community into this difficult challenge. The next day, 
each of the employees went back to the manager and thanked the manager for requiring them to have the conversation. And it saved the community of the organization in the sense that it stopped that cancer of complaint and bitterness and rancor from going, growing. We all make mistakes as managers, as leaders. And so we can be thankful that God has provided a way for us, salvation, because we do make mistakes. We're not perfect in terms of making wise decisions. But I want to leave with you this thought that wisdom in the scripture is primarily about morals, not primarily about money. You can't study the Bible idea of wisdom too long before you get to the idea of holiness. So that, to that I want to turn next. Holiness. I'll have to, to uh, confess that early years of my adult life, I was uncomfortable with the idea of holiness. I knew I was not morally pure. And I saw the scripture passages that say, be holy. And I thought, no way is this happening. And I was just uncomfortable with the scripture challenge to us to be holy because I was looking at holiness primarily in terms of moral purity, absolute moral purity, which only God enjoys. The theme of holiness, just like the theme of wisdom, takes us into the, the, the area of strategic commitments, making a big commitment. It says in Leviticus, consecrate yourselves and be holy. Part of holiness in the scripture I do, thinking is, is this idea of consecration, making the huge commitment. So when 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 talks about be holy, he's actually, he makes reference to the fact that he's quoting from an earlier writing. And most scholars think he's quoting directly from the book of Leviticus, the writings of Moses. So when I saw 1 Peter, I thought, okay, I want to go see what Moses says in Leviticus. Now, I'll have to tell you that I've never heard a sermon on Leviticus for at least a long time, maybe ever. I don't know how often you hear your pastor preach about Leviticus. But there's a lot of wisdom there for people in business, especially Leviticus 11 and Leviticus 19. Where in both chapters, it says, be holy. Leviticus 19 is very interesting. Now, while there's some really hard things to understand about what is said on Leviticus 19, the things that are said related to economics and business and the marketplace, they're clear as a bell. They're pretty clear. It's, it's, it's really not hard to grasp what he says there. He says, don't put a stumbling block in front of a blind person. Be holy, don't, don't put stumbling blocks. And if you're in interaction with a deaf person, don't say bad things about this person that cannot hear you. Be holy, okay? When you harvest your field, make sure you include the people that are at the fringes of economic productivity. Leave the corners of your fields for the poor, the widows. Don't withhold the wages of your hired worker until the next morning. Now, what's, what's being said in all of these examples, as I see it, is if you're in business, you're going to be in relationship to some who are vulnerable. Now, isn't it true that in business, the, the, super, the subordinate is vulnerable to the supervisor? And isn't it true that the supervisor is somewhat vulnerable to the subordinate? Isn't the, the buyer vulnerable to the seller? And vice versa, isn't that also true? Vulnerability is common. In fact, it's part and parcel to the economic dimension of life. Vulnerability. We are all vulnerable to the downside trade-offs 
the hidden costs, the hidden information. It says in, in 1 Peter 1.15 that Christ, Jesus Christ is the Holy One. His identity is tied up with holiness. Holiness is what God it separates sin from God. But holiness also is what drives him, according to the experts, is what drives God toward us in love. Oh, by the way, in Leviticus 19, verse 18, it says, do not take vengeance. Love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus actually quotes from that uh, in the New Testament as well. It comes from Leviticus 19. Do not take vengeance. Be holy. You're going to be tempted. Someone's going to do you wrong. You're going to be tempted to do wrong against them. Nowhere is this more common than in the world of business. People taking vengeance and revenge. Have you ever prayed for, the, for God to provide you with the opportunity to expand his kingdom through your organization? And if a Christian, a fellow Christian in another organization goes on hard times, have you ever thought, well, now, if those Christian leaders in that organization had been praying to God, God would have guided them. Have you ever had that thought before? I'm not suggesting that that's the kind of thinking we ought to have. If a non-Christian competitor experiences hard times, do you find yourself thinking, wow, there's an opportunity for us to expand God's kingdom. God has answered our prayers. Really? The vulnerability of a competitor is your answer to prayer? I don't know. Christians say in business, in fact, the purpose of business, some say, is to bring glory to God. But how do we show this? If you ask Peter and Moses, they would say, pay attention to the vulnerable in the marketplace. Here's some examples of the kinds of stumbling blocks that we sometimes see put in each other's way. Stumbling blocks that are there that we have an opportunity to remove. Stumbling blocks which are real challenges for the vulnerable in business. This is a hard saying for some, some in Christians because some Christians in business think, you know, they're responsible for themselves. I'm not responsible for them. But hidden in the Leviticus and by quotation in Peter's epistle, hidden in the statements about things not to do is a positive implication. Not only should we remove stumbling blocks, but we should not put stumbling blocks in front of the blind. Now, contracts in business, agreements in business, can either remove or create stumbling blocks for people. The more complicated the contract, the more likely there's a stumbling block in there somewhere. More difficult for one of the parties, the other party, to understand what is in being said, the provisions. The more technical the language, the higher the volume of the legal terms in contracts, more likely it's going to be a stumbling block for some people. So what's the responsibility for the Christian? Is there a responsibility that we have to remove the stomach, to make it clear, this is what the contract is saying. If you sign this document, this is what you're getting into. In modern day business, that's one of the ways I believe we can remove stumbling blocks. When we uh, make a mistake, a mistake in quotes, and leave out important information, for the vulnerable, that's a stumbling block. You know, one of the challenges in business is what we call asymmetry of knowledge. One party always has certain knowledge that the other party doesn't have, vice versa, okay? And this asymmetry creates vulnerability. I believe that Peter and Moses would say, take a look at the asymmetry. And as a Christian leader in business, what is your responsibility to do with that? 
when a salesperson compares the features and benefits and maybe the price of their product compared to a competitor. And then they leave out certain information that is also important. Are they creating a stumbling block? I think so. When arrangements in business are ambiguous, that's a stumbling block. When one party to the agreement imposes an arbitrary deadline on the other, that's a stumbling block. It's putting uh, pressure. It's, it's an attempt to manipulate. When initial general glowing promises are later changed only after the other party has started making commitments, these glowing promises are now changed to specific information that is less favorable. That's a dirty trick too, but it's also a stumbling block. If you have a job opening in your organization that a disabled person can fill, but you gloss over, you ignore, the disabled person, you ignore, I would say, our responsibility to reach out to the edges of economic productivity and bring in those who are at the fringes so that they can also participate. That's an issue of vulnerability. When an unlovely employee gets disciplined, they are vulnerable. And what do you do? Do you shun them, ignore them, how we organize for work creates a whole host of hidden stumbling blocks. Too many and too complicated to go into right now. And of course, there are a lot of ethical pitfalls and icebergs that managers face. And a Christian manager might be able to anticipate some ethical pitfalls coming up ahead to be a stumbling block unless the manager does something to remove those. I think there's a couple of careers that are really important for removing stumbling blocks overall. Lawyers and anybody who does anything related to negotiations. If you're a salesperson or in some other way, if you're a buyer for an organization and you're negotiating, perfect occup occupations to live the life of holiness and to show God's glory through your career. So I encourage you to look, actively look for the stumbling blocks and throw them in the ditch. We're not gonna be perfect at this, okay? We're gonna miss some. And we're some, sometimes we're gonna avoid some of these stumbling blocks, just like the um, story of the Good Samaritan where the people walked on the other side of the, the road. We're not gonna be perfect. We're gonna make mistakes. You can't study the concept of wisdom and holiness without coming to the idea of, of redemption. And to that, I turn next. These themes, as I mentioned at the beginning, are inseparable, interrelated, intertwined. In the scripture, any time God takes an action that results in a change from something worse to something better, from a position of misery to a position of flourishing, from hurt to healing, uh, from welfare that has been harmed and put at risk to well-being that has been improved or made certain. The Bible calls these different situations redemption. Redemption is multifaceted. It is wider than, but it definitely includes the central concept that God has redeemed us in Christ by faith. The work that he has done for us outside of us is redemption. The great plan of redemption, however, comprehends not only the work that he has done outside of us in Christ's finished work, but also the work he is doing inside of us to, to restore his image. So it's this restoration that, it also, that is also redemption. Just like government organizations and human service nonprofit organizations do in preparation for a major hurricane, which we've seen recently, by pre-positioning the rescue and recovery resources in strategic locations, by organizing their collective efforts, by communicating with among themselves and with the public, so 
in like manner, the great plan of salvation encompasses a wide perspective of both rescue, recovery, and rebuilding. The plan of redemption involves the restoration of human beings into the image of God. And it is this restoration process that we have opportunities to emulate God's character and thereby bear witness to, work, to the work of God. It's not our job to provide for the forgiveness of sins. That has been taken care of. But God asks us to participate in the restoration process. And there's several implications for business in this. While businesses perhaps should not be expected to repair every kind of relationship in society, businesses do have a responsibility to heal the economic relationships that involve players in the marketplace, employees, customers, suppliers, strategic alliance partners. Business plays a key role in bringing stability to all these relationships or recovering these relationships when these relationships make it difficult for flourishing. The person who works in the marketplace playing a role of either manufacturing or distributing or marketing, promoting necessary products is working not only for the things that come from the hand of our creator, but the manufacturing and distribution and the promotion of necessary products also involves work with things that have been purchased by the Redeemer. Just like people, organizations need restoration and redemption. Look around your organization. Where do you see the need to restore towards biblical principles so that it serves the community in a way that fosters well being for all? Anytime we work for, to bring healing, blessing, and saving of life and preservation of life to others, we are participating in the redemption. Anytime we bear the blame or the responsibility for problems that come up as leaders, we are doing redemption. My friend Joe Bucci at Regent University has written an important work on redemption as it relates to dealing with uh, employees. And in particular, giving subordinates a second chance is a redemptive kind of leadership action to take. The accountant who keeps careful records is preventing and also restoring work. It's a work of redemption. When the accountant encourages others to follow generally accepted accounting principles, this prevents hundreds, if not thousands of people from acting in ways that are destructive. That's a redemptive kind of occupation and career. If you're looking for a place to invest capital, think about businesses and industries that at their core contribute directly to the restoration of humans or the restoration of the earth. Wisdom, holiness, and redemption are just three distinctive ways to think about Jesus Christ as being central to our work. So I wanna talk a little bit more about this, how Jesus Christ is relevant in your business. The common ideas that Christians have, at least the ones that I've seen on the internet recently, nibble at the edges of what it means to be Christ-centered. To be Christ-centered, some say, is to be his ambassadors to go out and make his disciples. But I wonder if the tendency is to make disciples according to our desires and not focusing on his central characteristics and identity. Another way some have said to be Christ-centered in your business is to pray before making decisions. That way your decision will be blessed by God and you will mysteriously avoid making bad decisions. You know, we believe that the Holy Spirit is inside of us. And if we simply say a prayer, some believe, the Holy Spirit will guide us. And the decision we make will be the right one. Well, what 
some fail to understand is the Holy Spirit does not work apart from God's word. It's not just a private thought that we're having in our mind. And somehow we think that's the Holy Spirit speaking if we prayed. And if we didn't pray, it must not be the Holy Spirit. Another way that common ideas come out in terms of being Christ-centered is to treat everyone with respect and courtesy and gentleness. I don't disagree with this, but a person can do all this and still not be Christ-centered in its fullest sense, even as important as respect and compassion and love are. That is, those are elements of one of the important themes of Scripture, loving kindness of God. But when we simplify love down to just a few things, and we think that's all we need to do as a Christian community, that's nibbling at the edges. Some say, well, to be Christ-centered, follow the advice of fellow Christians. Well, okay, sounds good on paper, but not all Christians are Christ-centered. <laughs> and there are some times that as Christians, we are dealing with non-Christians that we need to listen to also. Christians do not have a monopoly on ethics, okay? And so, yes, I see the value of following Christian counselors, but sometimes we need to listen to the non-Christians also. There's another view about what it means to be Christ-centered in your business. And this view is centered on the identity and the character of Christ. This is what makes him central in all of scripture and all of life. It's possible to believe in Christ and still not be Christ-centered in our work. We can do church, we can pray, we can do Christian things and still give little thought to the beautiful complexity of Christ's character and what it means for us in business. A teaching from the scripture, like the teaching regarding business, is Christ-centered only as it comes from Jesus Christ or points directly to him. Sometimes this requires a deeper understanding. Which leads me to the last question. Why are you in business? The approach I'm suggesting today considers that the whole plan of redemption, including Christ's work for us on the cross and the work of transformation in us by the Holy Spirit. Christ created us in the image of God and that image was marred by sin but he wants to restore that image. The restoration of the image of God involves the spirit-guided and spirit-empowered imitation of Christ's character, found not in our private opinions, but in scripture. This means that imitating Christ's character and identity and our work in the marketplace are so closely interwoven, they're not two separate things. They're the same thing. And if we're looking for a deeper purpose for business, this is where it is, in my view, the restoration of the image of God. Of course, bringing glory to God. Of course, supporting our families and providing for their needs. But the deeper purpose related to the plan of redemption is participating in the restoration of God's character. So I'm gonna open it up for questions now. I think Darren may have been collecting some of these, if there have been some. I'm looking at the chat room here and, and uh, seeing what we have. Okay, we've got this first question here. You mentioned that wisdom is about moral aspects and not necessarily about money. Could you elaborate on how these aspects relate to aspects such as stewardship or our roles as stewards? That's a question from Alan. Okay, Alan. Yeah, thank you. Well, I don't mean to characterize this as, as if uh, they're opposite of each other or in conflict. It's just that the common idea in the business world is that if you're gonna be wise and smart, uh, it's about street smarts with money. And the scriptural perspective is primarily about the moral foundation for our decision-making. It doesn't ignore the importance of money. Uh, in fact, scripture recognizes that money is in making money and wealth uh, is a part of human experience. But the primary focus of wisdom is the moral foundation for decision-making, okay? Decision-making that includes 
the community's interests, not just my interests. So when we talk about stewardship, yes, uh, one could say that's a part of being wise because we're, we're being wise stewards with not only our resources, but our resources are in a way part of the community resources. And so being wise stewards of resources we have responsibility for is or can be uh, an important aspect of looking out for the wider community resources. I don't know if that answers your question completely, but, but um, that's my initial thoughts. Any other questions? This has been excellent, Michael. When you talked about the stumbling block from Leviticus, is that that's kind of the same concept Jesus talked about, where if you cause one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better if you had a millstone hung around your neck? Well, yeah, I think he's referring, uh, making reference to uh, the ideas from Moses, for sure. Um, but, you know, a blind person in ancient times, a blind person was trying to go about his or her business in the marketplace also, needing to get to the marketplace. And if you put a stumbling block in front of a marketplace, in front of a blind person, you might be able to get to products before that person gets and you have an advantage, right? And so you're going to place this person at a disadvantage. That's creating vulnerability. So remove, don't put a, don't create vulnerability. And I think there's a positive dimension to that also. Not only should we avoid creating vulnerability, we ought to try to, to rectify vulnerability when it's within our power. Now, I didn't say, we, we, I didn't have time to say all that we could say about vulnerability for the Christian. Uh, so we might make mistakes. We might miss sometimes when we could have removed the stumbling block and we didn't. Okay, so we can learn from those kinds of situations for sure. Um, but I think Jesus was aware of this challenge uh, that there were people on the margins of society, the blind, the children, the widows, the orphans, uh, that are vulnerable. And so be careful how we treat those. And this is one of the ways we can imitate him in holiness. Thank you for that. Any other questions? I see Laurie's comment in the chat, chat section here. Thanks. Looking forward to taking ideas into the class. Yeah, Laurie teaches ethics. Uh, thanks so much for participating today uh, in this. I hope it is helpful. And there might be other ethics professors uh, in the uh, group today as well. Here's one from Gary. Currently, there is a discussion on corporate governance. What are your views on this discussion and does it comport with Christian morals? Yeah, well, uh, I'm not sure what specific part of the conversation about governance uh, being referred to there, but uh, governance, of course, is an oversight function. Looking at the organization for which you're responsible, you're trying to serve the needs of the wider community by looking at what's going on inside the organization and its strategic decisions primarily, but sometimes operational issues as well. Uh, and it's, it's looking over the shoulders, if you will. And so if we say that leadership in the, from the scripture point of view wise leadership is primarily a moral foundation to be a Christian and participate on a governance body like a board of directors or board of trustees you've got to bring the you, you can't do your oversight function uh, without having a moral foundation that would be the bottom line uh, it's, it's absolutely vital to oversight in fact the higher you get in an organization in terms of authority and responsibility, the more moral values increase in terms of their importance. The top level leaders and the board of directors cannot be everywhere, I'm thinking from a corporate point of view, of course, can't be everywhere all the time in a corporation, especially international corporations, multinational. 
And so they tend to focus more and more on the top level values. And this is a wonderful opportunity for the Christian uh, in the boardroom to be a champion of wisdom, to be a champion for those who are vulnerable, to challenge the leaders, to saying, you're doing great things for the company. What are you doing for the most vulnerable in society? Okay. That would be kind of an oversight kind of question at the board of directors level. Because that recognizes that what we do in terms of economic strength has a much broader perspective that includes non-economic uh, flourishing dimensions as well. And so we're seeing in some boardrooms more and more interest in, in thinking about non-economic impacts on society and how the, or the corporation is having an effect. And so this goes directly with, in, in my view, with the idea of holiness and redemption and wisdom. And by the way, the other themes as well, because all these themes are intertwined and inter interconnected. This is a good question. Is adopting a pricing strategy that undercuts your competitor biblically ethical? <laughs> That's a challenging one. Um, I'd have to give some thought to that in terms of the three uh, themes that we consider today. I can see its value, especially if you're trying to introduce a product to the market and the only way to introduce the product successfully is to highlight its lower price. Um, on the other hand, if you're simply lowering price in order to, to uh, harm the competitor, that may not align up with scripture perspective, okay? Um, I'm gonna have to do some more thinking on that. Uh, it's a more complicated issue, might require more dialogue, among Christians uh, to see, okay, what, what is scripture intending here for us? On the one hand, we should offer quality products and services. And from a competitive point of view, yes, be competitive. On the other hand, to try to destroy the competitors that's already there, I don't see that there's scriptural support for that per se. Hmm. But it's a conversation that, that uh, is more complicated. Uh, that uh, we need to participate with others in, perhaps. And I'd be happy to dialogue off, offline about the, the complexities of that. Carlos asks, you mentioned that our role is to help mitigate the economic dysfunctions in a context of inflation and devaluation. What do you suggest a Christian leader do, uh, for example, for their employees suffering loss of purchasing power? Yeah, yeah, this is... This is another one of those complicated questions uh, because there are so many factors uh, affecting the employee, not just the salary and wages and benefits, okay? And so I would not uh, expect to give a simple answer to a complicated question, even from scripture. You know, scripture, I think, uh, implicitly recognizes the complexity of economic life. Scripture does not tell us specific things to do in specific situations, in, in a lot of situations. In some situations, yes. But in the more complicated situations that we face today, Peter doesn't know about, Paul doesn't know about corporations and, and all the complexity of, of the marketplace. Um, and so this, this is a complicated question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sidestep it, admittedly. And I apologize for that, but in a way I don't apologize because the complexity of it calls for a more complicated answer. Uh, I think to the degree that uh, business owners can give employees a break in terms of uh, increase in wages, to the degree that they can do good in that regard, yes, but not to harm the ability of the organization to serve society in doing that. Uh, wages increase becomes a new part of the fixed costs, generally. In some situations, no, but generally it is part of the fixed costs, which raises the bar of uh, needing to break even, which raises the bar of demand on more sales, 
or in some other ways, cutting costs, which might harm the quality of the product. Okay, so we've got all of these factors that are intertwined. Um, in some organizations, there is an opportunity to do good by increasing wages. Yes, and perhaps decreasing uh, owner equity as a result, perhaps. In other situations, it would be dangerous to raise more than just a little bit uh, or at all. Every marketplace, every product and industry is different in terms of the dynamics and the, the pricing competitiveness in the marketplace. And so I, I think there's not one size answer that fits all situations, um, but it, it does require a conversation among well-meaning Christians who want to follow Christ. We do have another question or two, Michael, but I wanted to just give you a chance to share before people jump off. We do want to end officially on time. Michael may be willing to uh, answer these, these last remaining questions um, over time. But um, what do you want to say, Michael, about where people can connect with you and hear more from you? Yeah, um, of course, you can, if you want to read a little bit more about uh, the principles of flourishing life that I've published in articles, you can go to Google Scholar and find most of my academic articles there. Not all of them, but most of them. Also would be willing to receive emails if you have follow up questions or comments, mcafferkey at southern.edu. I've retired from my work at Southern, but uh, one of the things that Southern offers retiring professors is to continue using their email address. And so if, at least for the time being, for the last four years, I've been using that mcafferkey at southern.edu. And so we'll be willing to respond to questions and comments that way as well. And yes, uh, to answer one question, we are going to have this recording available and, and you can listen to any of the past webinars from CCB at christianityandbusiness.com. Um, I think we've got about seven of them now at this point. Um, uh, how about, let's see, one more question here. Um, uh, okay. Big box retailers and deep discount national chains often enter a community and cause closure of many small re retailers. How should Christians view this kind of competition? <laughs> Wow. Well, you know, the issue of pricing, the issue of wages, and now the issue of, uh, uh, and I don't mean to demean these questions. These are the more difficult, complicated uh, issues that come up uh, and require, require Christians everywhere to participate in the dialogue. On the one hand, yes, protect, maybe protectionism isn't the best word to use, but to, uh, to help small businesses thrive in the face of a marketplace that is changing, at least for some communities, it has changed uh, for certain types of products. How to help the small businesses provide, to, to survive is a challenge. Um, some small businesses have found ways around that uh, by changing their product mix and so forth, changing their their level of service and so forth. Um, but it's, again, it's not an easy question. And I know it probably feels like I'm just dodging the answer, but I am, uh, but in part because of limited time and it, it requires a more complicated conversation. If we take into consideration all the economic uh, dimensions that are present there, all of us want lower prices, okay? And access to um, more choices as customers. But we also recognize the need for small businesses owned by local families to provide for their families and to have a successful uh, entrepreneurship career as well. And we each experience this tension inside of us as we are buyers and sellers. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it at that, but I recognize that I've dodged the answer uh, and intentionally so. I think you are ready for politics, Michael. <laughs> well, you know, I didn't mention politicians, but 
but um, there is an issue of wisdom related to politicians and the need to, to speak on behalf of the, the one or the minority as well as the majority at the same time. And sometimes we hate politicians because they don't do a very good job of uh, keeping in balance the needs of the one versus the needs of the many. Um, but that's a scriptural idea to, to try to try our best and, and we will make mistakes at that. But no, I'm not gonna go into politics. I'm, I'm not good at articulating. Uh, I need to give a lot of thought. I can work behind the scenes for a politician, but not up front, uh, as you've just noticed, answering tough questions. <laughs> Well, you have answered a lot of um, tough questions during this presentation. So we thank you for um, helping us think and helping us grow today, Michael. Um, everybody, you can reach out to Michael. There's a, a couple of questions we didn't have time uh, for, but if you uh, shoot Michael an email, I'm sure he would be willing to answer those questions. But thank you all for sharing your time with us and, um, and just making us better as the overall um, Church of Jesus Christ worldwide, and as we're trying to represent him uh, well in the marketplace. And, and Mike, I'll let you have the last word. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thanks again for hosting uh, this webinar today and for inviting me to participate. And I just encourage all of us, including myself, the Christians who want a deeper personal relationship with Christ, to find uh, him in Scripture in the form of these themes that describe his, his personality, his, his character traits, his identity, and to spend more time considering him uh, every day. God bless you all. Well said. God bless you all. Thanks again. Take care.